Thank you, Stephen, you son of a bitch. <laughs> it kind of dawned on me uh, while I was preparing for this talk that you saw I was been in the club for 15 years. There's probably a lot of new members that have no idea why I get up here and do the joke of the day. So I thought I would just refresh your memories for some of you and tell you the story. So in 2006, I get a call. I had been performing as a professional comedian for a number of years, probably 15 years at least by that time. I get a call from David Bondi, and he says, hey, we'd like for you to come be our guest speaker at the Rotary Club of Baton Rouge. So I'm like, all right, yeah, what does it pay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> like, nothing. Uh, well, can I sell my CDs and DVDs after the talk? Oh, no, we don't allow that. I'm like, you mean to tell, I don't leave my house for free. So I did the gig, and then <laughs> I performed at the club, and it was great. I had a great time. Um, after, the, after I talked to the club, it was at Boudreaux's, I was outside talking to Ralph Sims. Uh, a lot of y'all probably remember Ralph, the older members, and Ralph was telling me, oh, yeah, look, in this club, we only get the top of the top, the top upper echelon of uh, Baton Rouge community. You know, we want the, we don't want mid-level managers, we get, you know, the CEOs and the division heads. We don't get just the professors at LSU, we want the heads of departments. And I'm like, so my membership is like off the table? <laughs> so, uh, but Charles Spencer, my friend over here, saw it in himself to give me a chance. My father was a lifelong Rotarian. And um, I had always wanted to join the Rotary Club. And Charles sponsored my membership, got me in the club. So I joined in 2006. Now at the time, uh, and look, I jumped through all the hoops. I mean, I donated my kidney. I gave blood. I did. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I didn't have to donate a kidney? <laughs> Charles, you lying son of a gun. <laughs> so I, uh, I joined the club, and at the time, Paul Gates was doing the new news. So he would come uh, most of the meetings uh, for, I don't know, 20 years, Charles, but, uh, and he would read the new news to the Rotary Club. Well, it, we got lost, you know, the news was all on your phone, and so he started doing jokes. Now, some of the jokes I would characterize as groaners, you know? You know <laughs> And so you'd be stuff like, uh, you know, what did the uh, snail say when he rode on the back of the turtle? Wee! <laughs> so he, he would read a lot of the jokes. He'd scour the internet. Well, then the last few years, he would kind of only show up half the time. And then uh, I think it was either Phyllis Mouton or uh, Warren Burkett came up with the idea, well, let's get you to fill in with a joke of the day when Paul doesn't show up. So I started doing that, and it worked out really well. And then pretty soon, we've, it was time for Paul to get phased out. And uh, they kind of gave him a graceful exit and had a little ceremony for him. And then I became the joke of the day. So in 2009, this was the very first joke of the day. Here we go. See who remembers it. <laughs> Paul Gates went to one of these big TV conventions in New Orleans. And he was there with about 10 of his buddies from WAFB, and they were all going out. They went out in New Orleans after the convention, and I mean, they had a good time. They closed the bars down at 3 o'clock in the morning. They're going back to their cars. They get to the parking lot where the car was. Paul Gates is stumbling out to his car, and right across the street was the New Orleans police officer just sitting in his car watching. He sees Paul walk out. He puts his key in the car. He had the wrong car. Paul walked around the parking lot. He tried five cars before he found his car. By that time, all his buddies had gone. Paul gets in his car. He drives out. As soon as his car hits the street, that policeman turned his lights on. He pulled Paul Gates over, gave, made him blow into that bad breath test, you know. <laughs> he blew 0, 0.0. The officer was like, what in the devil is going on here? Oh, Paul said, I'm the designated decoy. <laughs> That was my first joke of the day. <laughs> and then, of course, I tell a lot of jokes about Lauraville. That is where I'm from. My family has been in the Lauraville area since the mid-1700s. That's how long the Gonsalans have been in Lauraville. Uh, we go have a long history back there. Lauraville, and if you don't know about Lauraville, if you've never been, it's not a big town. The population of Lauraville is only 1,000 people. Yeah, that's it, 1,000. In fact, Lauraville has been a population 1,000 for the last 30 years. It's true. <laughs> 
Lowerville is the only town in South Louisiana that hasn't changed population in 30 years. See, every time a woman gets pregnant, a man leaves town. <laughs> I remember my daddy telling me stories about when the very first traffic light came to Lowerville. He said, oh man, you should have seen the town back then. Oh, it was something. The whole town was excited. We were getting our first traffic light. They had the colors picked out and everything. <laughs> he said, we even used to have a public library in, in, uh, in Lowerville. Oh, and I'll, I'll never forget the day they had to close the library down because somebody checked the book out. <laughs> My grandparents were even from Lowerville. My grandpa was born and raised in Lowerville, lived there his whole life. He lived way out in the country. In fact, my grandparents were married 65 years before they both died. Yeah, it was a long time for being married that back then. 65 years. I'll never forget when my grandparents woke up that morning and my grandma looked at my grandpa. She said, Papa, today's our 65th wedding anniversary. Isn't that something? She said, what you say I don't go kill a chicken and make a big Cajun gumbo? My grandpa said, why you want to blame a chicken for something that happened 65 years ago? <laughs> I remember my grandpa used to, every year during Lent, I always think of him during Lent before Easter because during Lent, he, he loved drinking beer. My grandpa, every year during Lent, would give up drinking beer for Lent. And the last year before he died, he, did, he gave up drinking beer all Lent long. And the night before Easter, he went and drank beer all night long to catch up. You know? <laughs> well, he was walking home down by Bayou Tesh early, early, like 6 o'clock in the morning because he didn't want anybody to see him coming home that late. Sure enough, they were having one of those sunrise Easter services and they were baptizing people in Bayou Tesh. My grandpa walked up too close to that. The preacher grabbed him behind the collar, drug him in the bayou, put his head in the water, pulled his head out. He said, have you seen Jesus? He said, no. He said, have you seen Jesus? He said, no. Pulled his head out again. He said, have you seen Jesus? <laughs> My grandpa said, no, but before you do that again, you sure that's where he went down? <laughs> <laughs> My daddy was born and raised in Lowerville, lived there. He still lives there to this day. Uh, now, he lived out in the country. Now, when I say in the country, they lived, my, my daddy was growing up, they lived so far out in the country, they didn't even have indoor plumbing. That's true, they had an outhouse. Now, I don't want to say that they were well off, but they had a two-holer. <laughs> <laughs> One time, him and his papa had gone out to each use a hole, you know, and his papa was buckling up his trousers, and a, a quarter fell out of his papa's pocket and rolled down the hole. That was a lot of money to my daddy back then. And he looked down the hole, he said, Papa, you dropped that quarter down the hole. His papa didn't say anything. He reached in his wallet, pulled out a $20 bill. My daddy had never seen that much money before in his life. He was staring at that money. His daddy reached over and dropped it right down the same hole. He said, Papa, why'd you drop that money down the hole? Well, he said, son, I, I just didn't have the heart to send you down there for just a quarter. <laughs> My dad is very smart, though. He's kind of one of those country smart guys. He still lives out in the Lower Bay. He lives on his farm. He's got cattle. He's got a nice pond way in the back of his property. And just last month, he drove up to his pond, and he saw three young ladies skinny dipping in his pond. Man, this lady saw my daddy drive up. They swam to the deep end, and they're like, we ain't coming out until you go away. My daddy said, ladies, I didn't come over here to watch you all swim naked or watch you get out the pond. I just came over here to feed my alligator. <laughs> <laughs> my, my daddy, he's 84 years old. My mama's in her almost 80, so they're getting along in years now. My, my mama started developing this bad habit the other day. She's been leaving the keys in the ignition to her car when she goes places. Man, my daddy's been getting on her. You can't do that. Somebody's going to steal your car. So she went to the mall in Lafayette a couple of weeks ago, the big mall of Acadiana, 
She came out the mall, started looking for her car. She couldn't find her car. She said, oh my God, I finally did it. I left the keys in the car, somebody stole the car. So she got her cell phone, she called up the Lafayette police. They came over here, they wrote the stolen car report. And then she had to call my daddy. <laughs> she said, baby, I finally did it. I left the keys in the car, somebody stole the car. My daddy said, nobody stole your car, I dropped you off at the mall. <laughs> She said, that's right, I forgot. She said, can you come and pick me up? He said, I sure can, just as soon as I convince this cop that I didn't steal your car. <laughs> that is a tough question, like how do you decide when somebody's too old to drive, you know? Now I have an old Cajun aunt, her name is Aspazi. She lives in Lorville. We call her Tante Asp, y'all know Aspazi? Okay. <laughs> She lives in, she's still driving and she's 95 years old. And in fact, I went to ride in the car with her. I let her drive me to New Iberia. We left Lorville. I'm in the passenger seat. We're driving down. We get into the first red light in Lorville. Shoop, runs right through a red light. I didn't want to say nothing, you know. I didn't want to make her nervous. So we go two blocks. Shoop, she runs another red light. Finally, I said, uh, I said, Tana Spazi, I, I don't want to alarm you, but you just ran two red lights back there. She goes, oh, I'm driving? <laughs> my my Todd Aspazi is, is one of those people, one of those old Cajuns that likes to twist up her words. Like, you know, it's, when you translate from Cajun French into English, sometimes the old Cajuns used to get their words all discombobulated and mixed up. My Todd Aspazi can mess up and discombobulate more words in one conversation than anybody I know, you know. Some people, you know, like say things like, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, like, I got pain in my, my sciatic nerve, right? The Cajuns have the satanic nerve. <laughs> uh, other people get spinal meningitis, we get smiling mighty Jesus. <laughs> Now when my Todd Aspazi talk, I called on the phone the other day, I said, hey Todd Aspazi, how you doing? Oh, she said, not too good. It all started the other day. I got in my Lincoln Confidential, because <laughs> I was going to the Walls Mart. Don't you know I got in a car accident? Well, I had to get on my cellulite phone. <laughs> I had to call the state petroleum officer, because I don't know how to text mex, you know. They ended up having to take me to the hospital because I'm a high blood, you know. They ran all kind of tests on me. They took ashtrays of my bones. They did scat scams, KGBs. They even tested me for cancer of the pantry. They ended up finding that I had Cadillacs in both eyes in trouble with my gastrointitutional system. <laughs> and the worst part of all, they had to put me on decapitated coffee. <laughs> I was fiberglasted. <laughs> well, the doctor finally came in to check me out. He said, tell me where it hurts. I said, doc, I hurt everywhere I touch. Look, I ya yawn. I ya yawn. I ya yawn. So he checked me out. He said, your finger's broken. <laughs> I, I actually, that was the joke that I told a few years ago when Coach O was our speaker at the stadium club. And I, I think I told it about one of Coach O's aunts or something. <laughs> and um, my son was playing football for LSU at the time and he didn't know I was speaking and Coach O was talking. So that afternoon, Coach O got to practice and he, wa he walked right up past my son. He goes, hey Jack, man, your dad's a funny dude, man. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is what I like to do. It's probably, um, I hope there's a lot of questions that people might have for me as a comedian. So what I want to do is the last few minutes I got, let me just open it up for questions and see, uh, oh, Fred. What you got, man? You mentioned that your son played football for LSU. Are there any other notable athletes in your family? Glad you asked. Yes. <laughs> well, you told me to ask that. Yes. No. 
Very good, Fred. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Fred, there was. <laughs> my great uncle, Onizim Gonsolin, oh, thank you. My great uncle, Onizim Gonsolin, was one of the best football players that ever came out of Iberia Parish. He went to Lowerville High School in the late 1940s. He was recruited by all the big schools, I'm telling you. One time at practice at Lowerville High School, they must have had about 25 coaches come to watch him play. And they were running, testing him out, and they were like, hey, Onizim, now tell us, can you run fast? He goes, can I run fast? And they clocked him in the 100-yard dash. He broke the state record. And they said, well, Onizim, that was good. He said, uh, can you catch the ball? Oh, Onizim said, can I catch? Man, they threw him 200 passes. He caught them all, one-handed catches, everything. They're like, man, that's impressive. They said, uh, tell us this, Onizim. They handed him a football. They said, uh, can you pass the ball? <laughs> Oh, he said, Coach, I don't know, but I tell you what, if I can swallow it, I can pass it. What's Kelly. Your favorite joke? Oh, my favorite joke. Glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite joke is actually, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to put this down again. And my favorite joke is actually one that I made up years ago. Um, and I put it on my CD and my, uh, my DVD, and I call it PB1 to PB2. <laughs> and I made up this joke, and it's always been my favorite. I get, I get more people come and tell me that they love this joke. So this is how it starts. So it, when, don't ever go speeding through any of our small Cajun towns. Cajun police departments can set speed traps like nobody else. In fact, when the, never ever go to a little town in St. Landry Parish called Port Barry, Louisiana. <laughs> Y'all got caught, see? <laughs> the Port Barry Police Department can set a speed trap like nobody else. In fact, when the Port Barry Police Department sets their speed trap, the entire Port Barry Police Department goes out there, both police cars. <laughs> they got Port Barry 1 and Port Barry 2. <laughs> and they each get on opposite ends of town on Highway 190, and then, they, of course, they have to talk to each other on their radio all the official police business, you know, and it sounds like that. <laughs> PB1 to PB2, come in. <laughs> <laughs> PB2 to PB1, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> PB1 to PB2, you're gonna get some fried chicken for supper. <laughs> 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 PB2 to PB1, affirmative on the chicken. <laughs> 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 PB1 to PB2, pick me up a tie and two wings, eh? <laughs> PB2 to PB1, 10-4 on that, just tell me where you at. <laughs> PB1 to PB2, what you mean where I'm at? I'm right here in the front seat, cool y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, you got a question? I saw your hand up. <laughs> Besides everything that happened in Lafayette or wherever, where do you get your material? Okay, well, I'll give you an example of the joke I just told you. So uh, I used to work during summers when I was in college. I worked at the St. Landry Parish Sheriff's Department as a radio dispatcher. <laughs> That's a true story. I was the radio dispatcher at St. Landry Parish. Apparently, I had the best accent of all the people that worked there. <laughs> and I used to listen, so I would, you know, send people, send deputies out on calls and I would listen to all the other traffic from the Port Barry Police Department and the Crot Springs and all that. And it was the funniest thing I had ever heard in my life. And especially with Port Barry, the, the chief was named Peanut. <laughs> and they would, you could hear him talking on the, where you at, Peanut? Come on, boy. <laughs> and they would just talk like that and they would say, Peanut, you gonna get some fried chicken for supper? <laughs> One time there was actually, um, <laughs> there was actually a, a fight that broke out at somebody's wedding. <laughs> it was a wedding reception and the two families didn't like each other and a big fight broke out. You know, the Seminole family get together, whatever, the family wedding. So I sent a deputy out to go uh, check it out and uh, he gets there and then I hear one of the state troopers call in and he's like, hey, uh, you know, I heard uh, one of you, your deputies get called out on the, I'm in the area, I'm gonna go check it out and help them out. So I get a call from the, back from the state trooper. He said, uh, he goes, there's a big crowd of people surrounding your deputy's car, and some of them are jumping on top of the car. <laughs> so I called the deputy, 61539, uh, everything all right? Oh, yeah, I'm just waiting for them to calm down. <laughs> You 
can't make that up. <laughs> so another example to answer more your question a little more directly. So I, I remember I made up this joke and it was something about, um, like I, I read an article that if you eat lots of berries, it's good for a man's health, good for your prostate, right? You eat a lot of berries, good for prostate health, whatever. So I, the joke was something like, um, you know, I went to my doctor and said, you know the old saying, a, a berry a day keeps the doctor's finger away. <laughs> so, and then one of my friends said, well, wouldn't it be funny if you just said a berry a day keeps the finger away? I'm like, yes, that's it. So I started, I, I took doctor out through that. And so sometimes it's just a question of like throwing in the right word and get, because it makes the audience think more like, you know, oh, okay, I the doctor's finger, I get that one. <laughs> anyway, that's all the planted questions I have. Does anybody else have a list? <laughs> Does anybody else have a legitimate question? How did you come by comedy? What was your education? Well, there's no education for comedy. <laughs> I had a grandmother who was very funny, and she loved to tell Cajun jokes. And I kind of grew up around that. And then I listened to accents. Um, the best, best summer job I ever had was at a pipe fitting factory in Opelousas. That was my summer job in Christmas before the Sheriff's Department. And they put me in a room with these two little old Cajun ladies, Evelyn Boudreau and Mary Badeau. <laughs> and I was their gopher. And I would just run. And they would sit there, and they would talk all day long about whatever, you know. <laughs> Mary, did you watch Knott's Landing last night? Oh, it was so good. <laughs> they would talk about the food they cooked. I put me up some shrimps last night. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> and so I just lo I loved the accent, and I started telling Cajun jokes. And then I discovered uh, there was an old Cajun comedian named Bud Fletcher. And he had an old tape that I got from him. He had made albums in the 60s. And I listened to some of those. And uh, when I was in college, we had a, jo a joke telling contest in the dorm. And I just took some of Bud Fletcher's jokes and I told these jokes and <laughs> it's like everybody loved it. And I just kind of took off from there. And then I, I eventually heard about this Cajun joke telling contest in Opelousas. And I entered the contest thinking, yeah, I could do that, it's easier. I, each comedian did 10 minutes and then they would award a winner. So I did my 10 minute routine and did pretty good. I didn't win, but I got called back. You know, I went back the next year, I finally won. And I, I hooked up with some of the other winners and we started performing professionally. We started a group in 2004 called the All-Star Cajun Comedy Tour. There were five of us, and we would go on tour. We would do fundraisers. We went all over the Texas, Mississippi, all over Louisiana. And it just kind of happened that way. And just, anybody else? I got a question. Ken? Yes. What do you think about the state of comedy in general nowadays? What do I think about the state of comedy in general? Uh, very disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of worried. Uh, I, I do get nervous now. Now that you know, guys are walking up, slapping people on stage, and uh, I heard even even Jerry Seinfeld stopped doing um, college campuses because he just got tired of all the political correctness and didn't want to. It's just it's too hard. You offend too many people. So it is. Fortunately for me, I've always done clean comedy, clean Cajun comedy, and I don't do any dirty jokes, so it makes it a lot easier that way. It's actually harder to do clean comedy than it is dirty comedy. It's easy to throw in a bunch of curse words and get people to laugh uh, with the right audience. Not this one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it does kind of kind of bother me, and um, you know, I, I've kind of I'm getting to the age where I've lost the uh, the passion to write new material. I remember reading uh, Steve. Um, named uh, actor uh, Steve Martin. 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 Uh, Steve Martin's autobiography and he, he said he doesn't do stand-up comedy anymore so that's a young man's game and that is true it's really hard to, to do comedy I mean I'm still telling these same old stale jokes you know? <laughs> so it's hard to come up with new material but hope that answered your question anybody else I think we're almost out of time oh, no. how do you keep track of all your jokes you got like little Damn right I do. <laughs> I write them all down. I have a script for every show that I've ever done for the last 31 years. I keep a script there in two binders, and I just keep adding them to there. Because I do get called back a lot to do dip the same group over and over again. And I'll, you know, I'll go back, find the date. Oh, there it is. Dang, I told all my good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> And so I have to tell different ones. So yeah, but the, it, I do have to keep track of all that. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, do you have a book that you publish of, of your material? You know, some, I thought about that. Somebody suggested that maybe I could take all the jokes of the day and put them in a book, and maybe the Rotary Club can sell it and do it a fundraiser or whatever. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I'll do it. Because <laughs> uh, I do have, I've written down every joke that I've told, and uh, I, I will say this, I think that's, is that, oh, okay, you'll be the last one. How do Cajuns feel about your humor? Oh, they love it, are you kidding? They <laughs> love it. No, Cajuns love to laugh at themselves. That is nothing better to them. My grandmother was, um, was punished for speaking French when she was in school, right? She was, she was one of the old Cajuns, and uh, she vowed, you know, the word kunas was a derogatory, it was a terrible term back then. Now people, you know, are proud to call themselves that. Uh, but back then, she was very offended. Um, she got very hurt when people would talk bad down to Cajuns. And um, in fact, she changed her accent. She lost her Cajun accent when she learned English because she didn't want to be called, um, you know, a dumb Cajun. But that's all changed. Cajun became popular, black and red fish, you know, whatever else, the cooking. So Cajuns are very proud of their heritage now. Um, I do want to say, since I think that's all we have time for, um, it, it has been a, a, indeed a pleasure to do the joke of the day for you guys all these years. And it, nothing warms my heart more than to hear when he says, and now for the joke of the day, and everybody claps. And it really it makes me happy. That's why I do it. I like to bring pleasure and laughter to people. Um, life is serious enough, and I got one more question from Charles. <laughs> oh, good, good question. So I did, once I joined Rotary, once you got me in, Charles, man, I went on the circuit. I hit every Rotary club from Vicksburg to Dallas. I did district conferences. I went to Flagstaff, Arizona. I did the international convention for Rotary in Los Angeles. I spoke at the one in New Orleans. Um, I've, hit, I've done so many district conferences, even the one in Gonzales. <laughs> so thank you all very much. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>